Hello everybody and welcome back to another technical overview video of the next aircraft in the steam gauge overhaul fleet from Black Square. This time the analog Bonanza, next time the analog Baron. For those of you unfamiliar with Black Square's aircraft, they're a little bit different than what you may have come to expect in other general aviation aircraft. Complexity is the name of the game. They're almost more like a study level airliner than other simplistic GA aircraft you may have seen before. There's even an environmental control system so you can practice keeping your passengers comfortable while learning to fly the aircraft. Owners of the analog King Air might be wondering how the complexity of a Bonanza could ever measure up. Well, there's a lot of features in this aircraft that you've probably never seen before, like the most advanced turbocharger simulation in Microsoft Flight Simulator to date. So let's get started. The first thing of note is that this aircraft is actually several in one. From the menu, we can select a normally aspirated aircraft, just like the default one, one with an extra 30 gallons of fuel in tip tanks, or a turbo normalized version. In fact, we can create any combination of these and more that we like using the config files. Just like Black Square's other aircraft, this one has a hot swapping radio panel, allowing you to choose between a GTN 750, the new working title GNS 530 and 430, or a no GPS option featuring the KNS 81 RNAV computer, the next generation of the KNS 80 that's in other Black Square aircraft. There's also the KFC 150 autopilot with flight director, and my personal favorite, the JPI EDM 800 engine monitor, which is almost completely simulated and will keep you very busy managing your big bore Continental in cruise flight. Getting started with the checklists, the aircraft is all configured for engine start, so all we have to do is select the proper checklist. Not just because there's so many, including emergency checklists, but because this aircraft is equipped with an advanced fuel-injected engine simulation capable of spark plug fouling, flooding, vapor lock, and even backfires. As we can see from the cylinder head temperature, the aircraft was running recently, making it prone to vapor lock. We can also hear the engine still cooling if we open the window. For this, we select the engine start hot checklist, which begins by setting the mixture to idle cutoff as opposed to a cold starting checklist. Propeller to high RPM, and then the auxiliary fuel pump on high for 10 to 20 seconds. I've seen many real world pilots run their battery dead because they weren't familiar with vapor lock starting technique and didn't do this one step. Auxiliary fuel pump off, mixture to full rich and throttle fully open. Run the auxiliary fuel pump on high again for another 2-3 to three seconds, ensuring fuel flow is above 3 gallons per hour for cylinder priming. Throttle open just a crack, and then we'll engage the starter motor. Watch the enunciator panel lights to see them dim as the starter motor pulls down the battery voltage. Once the engine starts, target 1000 RPM, temperatures and pressures are all in the green. Start enunciator is extinguished, as is the low voltage enunciator. Alternator load is below 25 amps within 2 minutes for battery charging. Bus volts 28 volts, engine instruments check. Lights as required, weather radar is off or on standby, and then avionics on. From here, we can configure the cabin climate controls to keep our passengers comfortable. It's currently 101 degrees Fahrenheit in the cabin, which is far too warm for comfort. We can begin to cool things down by opening the window and turning on the air conditioner and vent blowers. Next, a very important step for this aircraft, lean the mixture for taxi. Prolonged operation at high mixture settings and low manifold pressures on the ground can lead to spark plug fouling before we've even gotten to the runway, which will decrease takeoff performance and produce a noticeably rough running engine in this aircraft. We can also see the AC door extended light illuminate to let us know that the condenser door is in its fully extended ground position, which is only acceptable during ground operation. Next, I'll see you at the end of the runway for the run-up checklist. We're ready for the run-up, which is a great time to mention Black Square's failure system, which is accessible via the advanced pages of the weather radar display. It allows you to monitor engine condition, set mean time between failure for nearly every component in the aircraft, set scheduled failures, or adjust the global failure rate if you're looking for a challenge. This means that your run-up checklist is no longer simply a formality, but an important safety procedure to detect critical system failures before takeoff. 
The failure system is also now accessible via an HTML interface, meaning that you can connect it to your favorite third-party UI or instructor station. Getting started with the checklists, parking brake is set, enunciators test and consider. Remember, even the enunciator lights can fail in this aircraft. Remote compass is slaved and aligned, mixture full rich, throttle up to 1700 RPM. I'm going to rev the engine a little bit for you with the window open so you can hear the turbocharger sound. That's not just the recording of a turbocharger, it's actually being mixed on the fly based on the turbocharger's parameters. If the compressor blades had failed, we wouldn't hear the sound. And if you're not a fan of the high-pitched turbocharger sound, you can always disable it in the config files. Next, we'll bring the engine up to 1700 RPM and do a propeller check three times, each time looking for a different indication. First, we're looking for a drop in engine RPM. Next, a slight increase in manifold pressure. And last, a decrease in oil pressure in a single engine aircraft as the oil is being worked into the propeller hub. Next, we'll do a magneto check. There are five failures that pertain to just the magneto systems in this aircraft, including switch grounding failure, which gives purpose to a hot mag check on shutdown. We're looking for no more than 150 RPM drop and 50 RPM between the two. I'll demonstrate a backfire by making a typical rookie mistake and cycling the switch momentarily to the off position. Many other scenarios can also result in engine backfiring. Instrument air is in the green. Now we'll do an alternator check. Primary alternator off. We can see the meter goes to zero. Load meter to secondary is high off the scale. We see a blinking standby alternator light letting us know that we're trying to pull more power from the alternator than it can supply right now. And if we don't want to discharge the battery, we'll have to decrease our load. Turn the standby alternator off, the meter goes to zero. Load meter back to primary, and we can turn both back on. Propeller heat on goes to about 25 amps, and the load meter goes to 50. Propeller anti-ice off, throttle back down to 1000 RPM. Next we'll exercise the electric trim. We can see that it's working. And now an autopilot test. We'll set the heading bug 30 degrees to the left and engage the autopilot in heading hold mode. We can see the flight director banks to the left and the yoke follows. Move the heading bug 30 degrees to the right. Flight director banks to the right. Yoke banks to the right. Now we'll disengage the autopilot with the autopilot disconnect button once. We hear the tone and press it again to disengage the flight director. We'll engage the autopilot one more time in heading hold mode so that we can manually overpower the autopilot servos. Eventually, it'll give control back to us, allowing us to hand fly the airplane. Elevator trim is in the green and set for takeoff. Flaps check operation. This is the perfect example of a failure that might take you a while to notice because the circuit breaker can only trip when there's current flowing through it. Flaps set for takeoff. Windows are closed. The aft door is latched. We don't see the enunciator. Flight controls are free and correct on my joystick here. Altimeter is set. Departure altitude set in the altitude preselector. Takeoff heading is set. Panel lights dim for takeoff, parking brake release. Before takeoff checklist, mixture is full rich. Oil temperature is above 24 degrees C, which is the yellow mark on the gauge. Auxiliary fuel pump is off. Air conditioning off. We can see the cabin is now a comfortable 73 degrees. And we should see the AC door extended light extinguish for takeoff. Landing light on for visibility. Transponder on altitude reporting mode and weather radar on. We're ready for takeoff. I'll check in with you guys a little bit later to show you the EDM 800 engine monitor. Now that we're in cruise flight, you can see that we've traded in the air conditioning for heat and the cabin is a comfortable 74 degrees. 
We've opened the cabin heat valve, which admits hot air from the engine's heat exchanger, a component notorious for corrosion failure, which can admit poisonous carbon monoxide gas into the cabin. Luckily, we have a working carbon monoxide detector, which we can periodically test to make sure that it hasn't failed. The most important part of the Black Square turbocharger simulation is this. The mixture is still at full rich, even though we're at 12,500 feet, not something that you would see in other Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft. In a real aircraft, we would never lean the mixture of a turbocharged engine before crossing critical altitude or arriving at cruising altitude. Let's use the EDM 800 to find our optimal cruise mixture setting for this flight. Begin by pulling the mixture back until we see rough peak EGT on the bar graph. Then go back about halfway. Press the Lean Find button and hold down the bezel to push both buttons at once until we see Lean R for Rich of Peak. Then pull the mixture back slowly and continuously until we see one cylinder begin to flash and we see Leanest and then stop leaning. Best rich of peak operation is somewhere between 50 to 100 degrees rich of peak, in this case a negative number on the relative EGT. So we move the mixture forward and we can watch the horsepower number to find our peak power setting. In this case it looks to be about 70 degrees rich of peak. Now press the step button and then lean find Hold down both buttons again until we see Lean L for Lean, Lean of Peak. Pull the mixture back slowly and continuously, this time until we see Richest. If the mixture knob is too sensitive for Lean of Peak operation, use the friction lock to adjust the sensitivity of the lever. Best Lean of Peak operation is somewhere between 25 to 50 degrees Lean of Peak. Here you can see we're saving over 3 gallons per hour of fuel at a cost of only 20 to 25 horsepower. Press STEP to return to normal operation. From here the EDM 800 will automatically show you all of the information it has to offer. Flip the data switch to fuel flow to see information pertaining to the GPS and fuel totalizer, such as gallons per hour of fuel consumed, gallons used since start, gallons of fuel currently remaining, gallons of fuel required to reach our destination, gallons in reserve once we reach our destination, and miles per gallon. Also endurance in hours and minutes. Another important feature to keep in mind on the EDM 800 is the cylinder head cooling rate, which here is about zero degrees per minute since we're in cruise flight. As you begin to reduce power and descend, try to keep this number below 60 degrees per minute. Careful use of cowl flaps will ensure that you avoid engine damage. There's one more cool feature of the turbocharger simulation that I want to show you, but it requires being at a much higher altitude, so I'll be right back with you in just a moment. We're now up at 22,500 feet with our oxygen system on, well above the critical altitude of this turbo-normalized aircraft which means that we now must lean the mixture just as we would with a normally aspirated engine and can no longer maintain sea level manifold pressure. However, there's one more intricacy to operation beyond the critical altitude. If we reduce the throttle setting rapidly, the turbocharger will slow down and no longer produce enough pressurized air to continue combustion at the current mixture setting. This can present as a total engine failure or at least a loss in throttle control. Let's see what happens. The only way to get yourself out of this situation is to bring both the throttle and the mixture back and increase both continuously and together until we get back to where we were. This can also result from a catastrophic turbocharger failure. A turbocharger failure, however, is only reason to land as soon as you can, while an apparent engine failure may be reason to land a lot sooner than you may have liked to. That's it for the Analog Bonanza today, even though there are more features than I could possibly show in an hour-long video. However, there is one more thing which happens to be my favorite addition now available in the whole Steam Gauge overhaul fleet, and that is radio navigation signal degradation. 
If you're tired of having a perfectly centered CDI needle while tracking a VOR station from over 100 nautical miles away, those days are gone. These aircraft now have signal attenuation and noise filtering mathematics that produce a very convincing simulation that reminds me of my own aircraft. The math is all different for NDBs, VORs, localizers, and glide slope antennas. We're about to pass directly over a VOR station at 12,000 feet. At this altitude, the cross-section of the cone of confusion directly over the station's antenna should be about three nautical miles in diameter. As we get closer to the station, the CDI needle in the HSI will begin to wander, and the two from flags will start to flutter as the derivative of the noise of the VOR's phased signal increases. As we pass directly over the station, the nav flag will come into view, indicating loss of signal. When we come out the other side, the CDI needle will slowly come to center and the two from indicators will gain confidence. This, of course, is just one type of signal degradation for one type of ground-based aid to navigation. If you go back and look in this video, you'll see the localizer's CDI needle wandering with the faint signal of a distant VOR station. I hope you're looking forward to experiencing this and so many more features in Black Square's Analog Bonanza, and that you'll tune in next time for another technical overview video of the Analog Baron. Until then, I wish you blue skies, and I'll see you in the next video.